We're fortunate to be joined by the CEO of Terraformation, Terraformation, Ishan Wong, who is our featured guest. And we also have Jonathan Kim, who's the head of product at Terraformation, who will be interviewing Ishan. Uh, Yishan, we're all eager to learn more about you and I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Thanks so much, Addy. Uh, so I have had the chance to do a pre-interview with Yishan, I mean, I guess frequently over the last year so that we've known each other. Um, and what I've gleaned is that over the past year, Yishan has been slowly making his way further and further west. Uh, originally born in Pennsylvania, grew up in Minnesota, um, and actually can whip out a Minnesota accent, it seems like, every once in a while. Uh, oh. Lived in the Bay Area for a bit, and then moved to Hawaii just a couple of years ago with your wife, two kids, and two dogs. Um, Ishan, you have a, an unreal uh, professional resume. You started out as a, a strong career in engineering management, worked at PayPal, Facebook, Square, uh, and then eventually recruited to be CEO of Reddit, and now the last couple of years founded your own company, Terraformation. So context setting for, for everybody. Um, my first question for you is, uh, so you built this awesome career, are really tightly connected with some of the most influential people in tech, like names like Elon Musk and um, Peter Thiel, names that I think a lot of people here probably know. Um, and uh, my question is, did you happen to find yourself at the right place in the right time? in a lot of these situations, or were there things that you did along the way to stack the deck in your favor? Uh, you know, I actually think that I was in the right place at the right time. Um, though I, I sort of think that like, you, you just have like occasional, everyone has like occasionally lucky events in life. Um, and most people are unprepared to take advantage of them. So it's really just like, you should be like preparing yourself to take advantage of lucky events that occur, right? And then it's just like, uh, I think the phrase I use with some people is like prepare for success, right? Like if something that would be really advantageous to you or some opportunity that would be really great, like hit you today, would you be able to take advantage of that? Uh, so th there's a lot of like right place in the right time, but it's sort of like be in places where lucky things can happen to you. I remember um, the story of how you you uh, got your job at PayPal. You happened to carpool in middle school with one of the, the founders who ended up being the founder of um, of YouTube. <laughs> and then you didn't even apply to Facebook. You quit your job at PayPal, and then somebody essentially found that out and recruited you. Like, what were some of the things that, that got you in that situation where people were referring you into those places? Oh, I actually, I, I did formally. Oh wait, no, I was. I don't remember if I was like if I formally applied or if they coached me. Um, so so there, there's a unique thing that actually happens in Silicon Valley and more broadly in tech, uh, which is that like, you sort of have to get into like your first company through, you know, regular means, you know, just like do well, apply, do well at the interview. But then after that, the more premium opportunities come if you distinguish yourself as doing a really good job. Um, and I found this is not just true for me. Um, people who just do really, really well get poached to good companies because you actually have this effect where companies have, you know, like the average tenure at a company is like, it's like four or five years, right? Um, and it's usually between two to six years. Uh, and so like what happens is you have a bunch of people at a company and maybe it's successful, maybe it's not. And then that company breaks up or those people leave and they go to a whole bunch of different companies. Um, one of those companies is likely to be like the next breakout success. And when it starts to break out, they begin hiring very rapidly. And they say, and this happens at every company, they say to them, who are all the really good people you worked with? We need to hire for these positions. And then the person who you knew at your first company, if they remember you as the best person on their team, even if you were, you were all doing something really boring or dumb, if you were the best person, they'll be like, oh, I remember so-and-so, I'm gonna to try to recruit them to this company. Mm -hmm. um, so you get pulled along the best opportunities by someone you know that you had previously impressed with on your, in your work, even if at that time you were not doing particularly important work. Um, I'm not sure that I ever did like really 
glamorous work at PayPal. Like I was actually, when I was hired, I was on the admin tools team, which was, if you were to rank the teams by like status, which you didn't really, but like, this was like the back end tools team. We had no designers, right? And it was just like, well, I was on that team. I just tried to do like a really good job. Um, and yeah, like people remember who you are and then you get pulled along um, to opportunities. And the, the best opportunities are also the ones that are generally growing very quickly. Like those are the, you know, sort of breakout success rates. Um, and so because this happens in four year periods, you can fit a lot of those into an average sized career. So eventually, if you just do really well, wherever you are, you'll get pulled into like some breakout success. Um, I actually <laughs> managed to like fall into like at least two of them. So there's definitely some luck there. Um, but everyone that I've known who is really successful generally follows this path. It's not like you apply from the outside. Um, you, you generally get like pulled in because somebody knew that you did good, good work elsewhere. Well, I think what I'm taking away from that too is that um, it ended up being compounding or possibly ended up being compounding because you worked at, I mean, maybe something, a trait that's unique to startups, right? You said every four years, that's the best, like standard vesting schedule. So like people at the end of their vesting schedule are highly incentivized to go out and maybe restart that at a younger company. Um, but uh, maybe that doesn't happen if you're at like a large CPG company. Like people don't just leave Procter and Gamble and start new companies. Like was that something that, like, would you I guess encourage people to start their career in, I don't know, a Facebook, a Google, or, or some sort of like up and coming type of startup, or or, or does it not matter? You can you just nail it wherever you land. Um, I would generally advise people to start there if you're starting your career. You, it should be somewhere small enough that there's enough structure so you're not like figuring out everything from the ground up right like at a, like a very very new company they don't even have payroll in place or like you know the ceo might be writing you a check you know every two weeks that's if they're responsible and they don't have your tax deductions correct and then at the end of the year you owe a bunch of taxes right like you don't want to be dealing with that. There, that that's not the maximally educational thing to be doing, right? You want to go to the thing that's the maximally educational, like experience that you can have, and you want it to be extremely intense. Um, and so, like a big company will take care of everything, and generally, bigger companies have like, like you can kind of coast. So, so you're not like performance is not as important. So you want to be sort of like in like the middle early stage, where like payroll's already working. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and like various like basic structures are there, but all of like maybe like business model and like product definition are not yet fully fleshed out and you have to figure it out and you're forced to figure it out. So like, and, and, but all that's in service of like the overall thing of like, you should just try to go someplace where you can like learn at the most intense rate possible. Because like when you're young, um, when you're starting out your career, you have the most time for that. Also probably nice that, um, I mean, YC especially, like a ton of companies have come out just making it easier for people to start companies. So that uh, payroll is, is thankfully not an issue, I think, for most companies anymore. Um, <laughs> one of the things you said though, so you started out managing a, a really small team when you were at PayPal and then you know, eventually larger and larger and larger teams over time and, and now a whole company. Um, like what's different when you're managing directly just a small team of engineers uh, versus managing like through layers and layers of managers? Um, actually at, at PayPal, I was actually thrown into this like trial by fire where they gave me like a team of like 17 people. Um, and, and like the optimal number of people to start with as for a manager is like three to five. Um, so th that was actually like really, really hard. And uh, how old were you at that point? Huh? How old were you at that point? I think I was 23 or 24. 23 and 24 and they're like you now manage the careers of 17 people yeah and and there were there were like people there who were like way older than me they were in their 40s it was like really intimidating and crazy um i i, I have no idea why those people would like take direction from me um so so yeah i i managed to get through that right um and i guess the difference in as you're managing like you're like managing managers right or you're managing entire organizations um, is like when you're a line manager, which is like the sort of way you refer to like someone who's managing someone who's directly doing the work, you can generally directly supervise work 
and evaluate results. Um, and then, and so what usually you're somebody who has like an understanding of how to do that job. So you can say like, look, the way you're doing it is like wrong or the way you're doing it is right. So like, you know, do it this way, whatever, right? And you can like directly supervise the output. There's like fairly close control there. And it's mostly a matter of how you interact with that person, how you give them feedback. Because some people like respond to certain incentives. Some people are like sensitive to criticism or whatever. And it's like, it's mostly about just that challenge. Mm -hmm. um, later when you're managing managers, you're like shaping leaders to do that. Um, and there's a lot of like developing personal bonds of trust. And it's like trust beyond just the like, oh, we're friends and we trust each other's to have our backs. It's trust in competence, right? And if you don't know if somebody is competent, then like you don't know if they are able to manage their team well. You just like can't know, right? So you have to do all these like diagnostic things like you have to do skip levels or you know you have to like figure out how to like ask good questions to figure stuff out and there, there's all these things about like just how to indirectly figure out if things are working correctly um and there's like i found that there's like actually like no easy answer to that or, or maybe there is and i'm just like not good enough um and that problem certainly becomes like very acute when you're like the ceo and there's like multiple levels um and then there's like one other really, really big thing to be aware of, which is it starts in a very small way when you're a manager, but then rapidly like increases, which is you're no longer a person. You're now you're a symbol, right? Like if you think about this, like um, even if you're a student, you've never been in like a company, there are people like administrators, like people who are like high up, you don't think of them as actual people. They're just like the position that they are. They're just a symbol to you, right? If, if like the director says something or the CEO says something, it's not like Ishan Wong, the flawed human being who like doesn't have complete information says something. It's like the CEO said, right? Like that's a, the symbol said something, right? Like when you say the president says something, nowadays we don't have much respect for presidents, but you know, like imagine, you know, in the, in the day, like a movie president, like Morgan Freeman, the president, right? Like said, it carries a lot of weight and becomes a symbol, even though they're just like another human being. So you have to be really aware of that. Um, and the things that you say can have disproportionate impact or be interpreted in a way that's totally different than how like a normal human being should interpret another normal human being saying a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so just awareness of those weird effects that come into play is, it's like a fairly rare element of human experience. Yeah. I, I remember a friend of mine told me that the uh, social media for, is a good example, right? Social media uh, as a job is held by the lowest paid person in the in a company or like, you know, the person, the intern uh, and also held by the CEO. Like that person is like materially important when it comes to sort of the vocal presence. Um, and yeah, can like move markets. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the, you know, you told me that you considered yourself to be like throughout your career, a good corporate soldier. Um, but I, and then, you know, later went on to be CEO of Reddit. And so at some point in your career, right, going from IC uh, of an engineer to managing people, you probably had to make a decision there. And then like, as you continue to go further up, like there must've been some departure where you made a decision of, do I want to be CEO? And then from CEO, like, do I want to start my own company? Like, were those active decisions that you made or did you, how did, how did you think about that? Um, well, I, I think there's a distinction, there's sort of implied distinction there that's um, not really there because there's a lot of thinking in like the startup world where it says like startup founders are like these mis misfits, right? They can't fit into whatever your company or whatever, they just don't fit in. Whatever. Um, and, and that's, you would contrast that from like being a good corporate soldier. Um, I was actually told, so very early on in my Silicon Valley career, I had like a family friend um, who's just like a friend of my parents, but he had been in Silicon Valley for like many decades. And when I went out there, he like gave me some advice. And one of the things he said was like, like in order to be a good general, you have to be a good soldier. Um, and, and I mean, the way I interpreted that is like, you need to know what it's like for people working in your company. Um, you, you can actually see this, you know, the opposite of this in effect, when you look at like certain founders who have in fact never been an employee anywhere. And they don't know anything about the experience of being an employee, except for what they're told intellectually, which is different than experiencing it. Um, and, and they'll like 
act or say things, which, I mean, it's like rapidly trained out of them, but it'll still like sort of leak out. Um, and, and I think like, if you want to be like a really good leader, you have to know like what it's like to have been led and to have like done well in those positions, right? Like you, you think about like, like generals in the army who are like really good leaders. No one's ever hired in as a general. Right? You don't have like your startup army, right? Um, you, they, they come up through the ranks, right? So they know what it's like for the enlisted. Um, and so they know like what it means and what the consequences of the things that they do, they have like a more acute understanding of that. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my case, like the progression into these roles was just like, I, I didn't, I don't think I really progressed through these roles in like a very conscious manner. Like I don't like plan it out. It's, it's just like, I just like fall into the next thing I do. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, you mentioned like, you know, a, a very common, maybe less common today, but like very common thing back in the day was like, find the most competent individual contributor and like put that person in charge of managing people, um, which sounds like that, you said that was how you got the role as manager uh, when you were at PayPal. Um, but like the CEO role, that must have been totally orthogonal in terms of skill set. Like, what was that? like conversation like, or even making that jump to be like, and now I want to be in charge of not just engineers, but like every possible discipline, you know, marketing and sales and like do all of this other stuff. And oh, I feel like it's hard to fall, hard to fall into, right? Someone's got to, there's gotta be like a conscious choice for that one. Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> well, there was a break in my career between like Facebook and Reddit. So, so I was like, you know, not employed for like two years or so. Um, before they recruited me to Reddit. Um, I was a very early user of Reddit. So, so I also sort of backed into that one in a weird way. Like I, I was a very early user of Reddit and you know, it's like the sort of like rebellious counterculture, like especially when it, when it was like early and, and had been like bought by this big company and they were spinning it out and they wanted to hire a CEO. And so like some VC, they, they had like they had asked a bunch of VCs for advice on how to hire a good tech CEO. Um, and some VC put my name on the list. I now know who it is. Um, and he said like, you know, you should talk to people like this not these like, you know, VP of IT at, at Verizon or something. This is like literally like a candidate, right? And, and so when they talked to me, I, I was like, they're, they're like, well, do you want to talk to us about like the role of being a CEO? And I was like, I'm not qualified for this, right? But I, I like said, okay, I'll throw my hat in the ring to try to keep you from hiring a bad CEO who will like ruin one of my favorite internet sites, All right? And so, so that we would have these conversations. Um, and back then, like Facebook was like this up and coming thing. So there's there's a lot of like prestige from being like ex early Facebook, um, whatever. And so like, I think they were they were impressed with some of my thinking and really interestingly, I think they really took a chance on me. Right, because I, I was not what you would call like a typical candidate, um, and so they, it was like they, they took a chance, and I was like, well, this guy has some like good thinking about Reddit, um, and where it can go, and so, so yeah, yeah, and then they, then I ended up like getting the job, right? So, so uh, yeah, it's kind of a weird circuitous path, or or maybe all CEOs are hard. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, that is interesting. So, you, so in a way, you did sort of reluctantly take it on like you um you kind of did fall into it right it sounds like people knew you and you sort of did it well, it sounds like not exactly wanting to uh, but doing it because uh to present something that you you really liked um, yeah i mean I'm, I'm not gonna lie and say like oh wow it'd be cool to be the ceo of reddit but i didn't really think i was like qualified hmm. <laughs> so, so it was really like well maybe i can keep them from hiring somebody terrible so that's fair I feel like a lot of CEOs and founders always feel like they're not qualified uh, for the job that they're doing. Otherwise, I feel like maybe you're not, well, maybe maybe they mean, maybe people in that situation could probably be dreaming bigger or are aware that they could be dreaming bigger. Yeah, I mean, now I think I'm qualified for this job, but on the other hand, our job is like really, really hard. So also kind of not. <laughs> yeah. One of the things you said about uh, the misfit sort of um, archetype for founders, I think it was interesting because um, I think in a lot of ways in getting to know you, I think you challenge all of these things that you read in like Forbes, right? Or, or Harvard Business Review, like you've got to wake up at 4 a.m. every morning and like, you know, brush and floss your teeth four times a day and like do push-ups before you're, you know, before you start your day. Um, but, uh, you know, I've learned over 
getting to know, well, getting to know you, you play a lot of video games. Uh, you have a night owl <laughs> schedule. Uh, you don't take meetings before like 10 or 11 in the morning. And, um, and also through some of the Reddit, like people consider you to be unusually kind, which maybe is a product coming out of, of Minnesota. Um, you know, compared especially to some of your maybe contemporaries from PayPal were considered to be like jerks or, or very divisive people to say the least. Um, what of it is like fluff versus substance when it comes to being effective as a founder CEO? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, first of all, we do not have conclusive evidence that I'm an effective CEO, right? We have not yet succeeded, right? So um, consider that. Um, you know, I really wish I were a morning person. Like there's definitely so much biology behind that. And I was always like, man, I, you know, I read about these CEOs like Carlos Goen, who, yeah, like, or like, ever, or like Tim Cook or whatever. They're like, yeah, they wake up at like 5 a.m. or 4. And it's like crazy. I so wish I could be an early morning, especially now that I've moved here. And like everyone wakes up early with the sun. And like, man, I wish I could do that because it's so awesome when you wake up early. It's, it's like the day is new. You can get like a, a breakfast at McDonald's. And it's like, just like, it's just great. Um, but I've never really been able to do that. And like, there's, there's this pretty firm biological clock and I decided like, okay, fine. I'm just gonna like, not try to like, um, like I'm CEO now, so I'm gonna decide when I'm gonna have my meetings, right? And I'm gonna preserve my sleep because getting enough sleep is good for thinking, which is good for the job, which is good for the company, right? That was my reason. And I found out recently, Jeff Bezos is like that. Someone asked him, what does he do in the morning? So does he like wake up early and do, do this, you know, the crazy thing that all these morning scenes, he's like, no, I just like putter, like until like noon. Mm. <laughs> and this is like when he was CEO, right? So this, I read this a few years ago. I was like, oh, okay. So there's at least one other CEO who's like that. Um, and so, so, I mean, I, I just like work really late into the night and stuff. Um, but yeah, all these like early people, I'm so jealous of them. Like, I, I want to be that. Right? <laughs> and I totally failed and I just can't, but I, I, I don't know. Um, so I don't, I also don't know that I'm, actually unusually kind um i'm like if you look up this thing there's like the the internet depiction of this is not like entirely like true to the facts but like there's this thing where like there's this guy who like we fired from reddit and i'm on record as like in public like uh like <laughs> what, what is it like um criticizing him in public uh, and, and so, so that's like, I think I'm, I, and, and I think like a lot of the PayPal people are like extra divisive. They're like very outspoken. Um, and, and that's like really, really beyond the norm um, because they're very opinionated. And it's interesting because the PayPal mafia has managed to exist separately from the rest of the VC ecosystem. And so they are often able to say things which are like, which many people who are within the, what do you call like the orthodox VC system, like can't say or, you know, won't say. And so they'll say like pretty politically incorrect things and they'll be like very divisive. Um, and, and because like they can like fund each other's companies, they don't care about like the VC, the powerful VCs that they offend or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, that's, that's like, I'm not giving a very good answer. I guess what I'm taking away is maybe you're actually only nicer than your peers, um, which I don't know if you're actually nice, as long as you're maybe. nice than some of those people. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's times when like, I'm like pretty, I, I call like severe or strict. Like I'm pretty demanding. Um, you, you don't think so? I mean, you're like working for me. I'm like pretty demanding about some shit. I, I'm always smiling and cracking jokes, so I don't know. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, well, I think what I took away from that, which I think other people have mentioned too, is designing the company around some of your strengths and weaknesses, right? Like rather than forcing yourself to be a morning person just because like that's what's expected of a CEO um, or like do any of those other things, uh, you, it sounds like maybe I'm projecting, but like I've designed or other people have, have tried to design like uh, things around them so that they 
accelerate their strengths or sort of bring out their strengths rather than try to shore up their weaknesses. Uh, That's definitely something you learn in CEO coaching. Like they're, they're like executive coaches for CEOs and, and they tell you like, you have certain strengths and weaknesses and you must shape your organization to make up for your weaknesses and play to your strengths. Um, although in my case, being a night person, what I should be doing is living on the East Coast um, so that I'm awake for like most of everything rather than this like really terrible thing where I'm bas basically like, I've got good hours for everybody who's in Asia. Yeah, but, yeah. So, or Europe. Uh, Europe's a little tricky. It's, it's exactly 12 hours offset. And so, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm talking about some of the people at Terraformation. Um, so, and I think you cited or, or hinted at some of them, but you were really fortunate to have a deep bench of colleagues that make up now the founding team at Terraformation. Um, I, I could say names here, but I don't think most of the people would know them per se, but uh, what was the conversation like? like how did you convince them to join the team? How did you convince them to take the leap and, and join this company with you? Um, well, first, I think like that, that came about as a result of like a vague 20 year long effort, which is that for whatever reason, and I didn't have this as a specific plan, but I just sort of thought that I should do this from the start, which was when I was, as, as soon as I started working, actually this started in college, whenever I would meet someone who was like really, really good at whatever they're doing, I would like just track them, right? Or which is to say, I would just like mentally note them in my mind, right? Back then, like, you know, I wasn't old, so I didn't think I had to write things down. So I just like heard them. Um, and so I would just like keep track of people who are really, really good that I worked really well with. And, and I was like, man, I want to work with, because, you know, you're in Silicon Valley, so you're in the startup culture, like, you know, one day you're going to start a startup. Here. And I was like, yeah, you know, one day I want to work with this person. I want to found a startup that is like, we work really well together and we have really complementary strengths, right? Um, and so you just sort of like track them, right? Um, and I just did this kind of passively as I was working. Um, everyone ends up doing something and that's the origin of that effect that I described clear, but I really did it consciously by just trying to remember everyone who was just really good. Um, and then in between when I was at Facebook and at uh, when I went to Reddit, I started this like invite only co-working space, right, which, which was like at, at the time, like co-working spaces were not very, they were not a popular thing. Like, in fact, there was just one in the area. And I, I don't know that the term was even very popular. They had a negative selection effect where because it was like free to join, you'd actually have like bad engineers there. Um, and, and so the people who were really good would go there would like not enjoy being around really bad engineers. Um, and, and so we like created this like invite only one and just invited like really good people. And so that like created this network 10 years before. And, and we just like did it because it was like fun to be around like, you know, other people who were really good who were between jobs. Um, and that turned out to like create this huge pool of talent. Um, and, and so like the conversation when this happened is, is very interesting because they weren't very long conversations. Like when I decided, okay, we'll turn this into a company. I like wrote this thing that said, okay, you can solve climate change if we all do this thing, right? And it's like straightforward and it can potentially work. And I posted this and then I think like, a local newspaper did a story on our solar desal place, right? And so I posted that and said like, hey, okay, I'm starting a company now. And then like people sort of like came out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, people who were like kind of retired, um, who didn't need to, um, saying like, hey, yeah, I wanna work on this. And, and, and then, so you can get to this point where you've developed enough relationships where if you have a compelling enough mission people will stand up and yeah and say like yes i want to do something with this so so it was a very and, and i this is a very atypical recruiting like experience right like i, I first i didn't ex expect it to work like that right but it sort of made sense given all the things that i did right um and i don't think that's how you normally recruit for startups <laughs> it's like a lot of times you don't have like 20 years and then like a really compelling mission were there, was there like a plan, I, I guess, like were you strategic about the types of skill sets that you brought in or was it sort of a, everybody came to you and then did you have to do a filtering process to be like, mm, actually we don't need, uh, I don't know. Uh, there, there's a, yeah, there's a bit of that where like, you're never, you're not gonna get like exactly the right fits for the skills. 
Um, and, and you've actually seen that since you're in the company, right? Like there, there's a little bit of like, it's not exactly jockeying around because jockeying implies like too much adversarial. So like one nice thing is like people who've known each other for like 20 years, like trust each other's intentions, right? So they can like aggressively go after each other or say like, I'm going to take this over from you. And the other person like will not interpret that as like an attack or a turf war, right? Um, and so, so there's a bit of like that. There's also like somebody that you've known a long time who wants to join and you may or may not have a position that like fits exactly. And so, so you sort of have to like figure this out. Um, there's, there's a bunch of people, other people who've like said that they'd be happy to join and want to contribute, but like, we just don't have like an exact role for them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, you do have to figure out roles, right? But it's, it's nice to have a lot of people who like want to join as opposed to having like no one who wants to join. Yeah. I, I just think it's so fascinating that of the people that you pulled, like managed to pull to the team, there's like the first PM that like that internal tools team that you had or worked at a PayPal, like your PM was there. Um, or QE, right? And then yeah. um, the other engineering manager who was like promoted at the same time in a trial by fire was like also at the company. Um, and uh, yeah, just like you've gathered people along the way. I mean, a lot of the investors are people from your Facebook days or, you know, other places. Um, so it's like you really did track them and, and pull them all along. Um, so they must have seen something new and just kind of also tracked you back, it sounds like. Yeah, pe people sort of just stay in touch, right? So it's like, it's nice. I think yeah, it's funny. A lot of our investors, are, we have tons of investors that are just like previously people I worked with. Yeah, so it sounds like no pressure, awesome. right? Like I don't want to let everyone down. <laughs> That's true. They're all your friends too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like Reed Hoffman had the same concept of tracking all of his friends and people who were good, except he created. And then he created LinkedIn. He, he had a more uh, documented way to do it. Yeah, he he's also like a very very like network relationship centric person. Though I think he was more conscious about it. I was just like. Yeah, or these are good people. It's like keep in touch. So. Yeah, the guy who makes the world's largest professional network. I, I would. <laughs> right. um, uh, one of the things that, I, so actually related to this, right, related to maybe the fundraising side of things, um, you know, one of the things I believe is that great and terrible companies have one thing, in, like have a, at least one thing in common, which is that they have seemingly like stupid or outrageous pitches. Um, what was, like, what was the pitch to investors when you told them that, hey, I'm going to plant trees? Like, that's my business model. Or that's, like, oh. that's what I'm going to go do. And then they're like, of course, here's $5 million and here's, here's another 35. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The, the pitch is like outrageous. It's like, we can solve climate change. Like, really. Um, very few companies just go and say that. And it's like, mostly they say we can mitigate climate change or we can, we have a, business model that is carbon negative and cash flow positive, right? Like, and you do that and then you make money while remo removing carbon. Uh, we, were, we were just like, hey, uh, I think we can solve climate change if we do this at enormous scale. And we have a team that can credibly maybe pull it off. Um, for anyone who gets like, you know, quantitative, it's like, well, this team has like a 0.1% chance of pulling it off. Um, but everyone else is like zero. And, and so like a rational investor will gamble some percentage of their net worth on that bet. Um, and, 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 and so that is also why many of our investors come from my network because in many cases, it was also based on like trust in my ability to execute um, and trust in other people that they also knew in the network who had worked at, had successfully done very large scale things. Um, such that they could believe that the team has a 0.1% chance of success, right? <laughs> but it's like better than zero. Uh, but yeah, it, it's like a totally outrageous pitch because like some investors, you talk to them about that and they, they just like, like, well, no, thank you, right? They were all very polite, right? They've now, and, and so like, you know, no, thank you, right? And other people were like, yeah, okay, I can see this, right? <laughs> so there's, there's, there's a famous thing that I think like Peter Thiel said about like um, raising VC, um, which is that you're looking for a market of one. You don't have to convince everyone. You just have to convince like one person, the right person to believe. Um, and, and normally that's, it's not entirely true because like you're looking for a lead investor or whatever. And then when we did our angel round, there were like 40 people that had convinced. So, um, but in, in general, you don't have to, it's important to realize that you don't have to convince everyone. You just have to convince like a small number of people 
for who understand the gamble that you're making and are willing to make that gamble. Sorry, the lighting in here is getting weird given the afternoon. I'm going to turn on some lights. I think I've heard other people describe it as you got to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, and uh, and basically, like, you don't, you can't get, like, if you're trying to raise money, um, I guess you're incentivized or encouraged not to give up because, right, you're only looking for a market of one. You could eventually find that person in the next meeting or the next, you know, coffee meeting that you go to. Yeah. Well, there's another thing, which is, like, you, you actually want to, like, so here's some advice for anyone who's raising money um, for their startup. Um, you do not want to talk to as many investors as you can find. That's the wrong strategy. Um, because every no is like emotionally corrosive to you and you'll like lose willpower and like you'll become depressed. What you actually want to do is you want to create as many self-selection mechanisms as possible up front. So you want to gate out all the investors that just aren't going to like um, get it, right? And you'll feel bad getting all these no's, but you want as many no's up front early as possible so that when, after you, so that when you invest the time and attention in doing a pitch, you have a higher success rate for the pitches that you do make. Um, this was like really important advice that I gave to like a founder who had a really controversial product. She had a women's health product. And those are like pretty difficult to get going in like this very male dominated VC world. And I, I told her like, yeah, there's no chance where you like are trying to convince some like white male VC um, to invest. You're not, you're not gonna like tip it in like your, your pitch, right? What you wanna do is like be upfront. And if they're interested, like just like send them an email if they're interested and it feels like they're going to be interested then do the pitch right just like exclude all of them and like don't do more than like i don't know two pitches a week or something um because she was like getting like super burned out um so so i think like that's pretty important and we did a little bit of that because you can't go to most people to most investors and say hi i have a crazy plan to solve climate change right <laughs> and, and and you know many of them will be polite and if you like, like you, I'm at a point where I can almost always get someone to take a meeting with me, right? But you don't want to just like, just because you can get a meeting doesn't really mean that you want to do that meeting, right? Because it takes time and it takes energy. Um, I'm an introvert, so it's also like harder for me. Um, so you want to do a lot of self, like things to get people to self-select out or figure out whether or not they're really likely to be interested in it. Yeah. It probably ends up also being a much more uh, efficient use of time because that you know some companies out here spend six months raising around and by then they get maybe you know they're they're out of runway and they've got to start raising again after they close it. Um, yeah. So yes, yeah, small. It sounds like smaller amount of time, just highly focused, um, and then you can kind of go back and execute. Yeah. Um, so can we talk? I'd love to talk a little bit about Hawaii. I think it's one of the things that we love to talk about on on this series. Um, I thought it was really interesting. You told me that one of your reasons for moving to Hawaii was that you really liked that there was no tech scene here, that nobody cared what you did. Like you could go down to the farmer's market and like you could say, oh yeah, I work with computers, you know, as founder of this thing. And, and someone would be like, I don't care. I got mangoes this season. Like I'm, I'm the richest man in the city right now. Um, now, that you're, now that you're doing Terraformation right now, that you're, you're sort of back in the limelight and trying to have this big global movement, has that motivation changed at all? Um, most people here still don't care, which is nice. Um, the, the, what's important to understand about like that difference is like that difference is like super huge um, between like here, like it's, it's a matter of degree, right? And because like in Silicon Valley, every single conversation you have gets instrumentalized. You are always being sized up to see if, you know, they ask you like, what do you do? What company do you work for? And there's like this pecking order, right? Actually, it's like, are you a self-made billionaire? Are you a billionaire VC? Are you a moderately successful founder? Are you, there's like this whole thing and it goes all the way down to, you know, like are you a product manager, are you a, whatever, like, and, and like people figure out where you are in that pecking order, right? Like if you are an investor or someone who could help them, a potential angel investor, or, you know, you could in to like get a job at this company where like you're quickly evaluated for your place in the pecking order, if you can help them, they will talk to you. If they don't, they will just ignore you, right? And so there, there are people in Silicon Valley who are not in the tech scene and they really hate it. Like they're often like spouses or partners of people in the tech scene and you'll go to a party and people say, oh, you're like an English major or like you do whatever. And, and then they just like ignore you, right? It's like really bad. 
the same thing turns out also happens in Hollywood. So every like party or social event is like that. So I think that's just like the case in like industry towns, although like, you know, they say like New York is an industry town, but New York has like four industries. So it's a little bit, you know, more like spread out. Although it's still like, oh, he works at a hedge fund or whatever, he works at like Condé Nast. Or, um, here, there's none of that. Um, and, and like occasionally people hear about what we're doing. Um, but most of the time, if they're ever impressed, they're just impressed because like we figured out a way to make water and you need water and you can grow things and that means more food. Like people care about like the practical actual applications of what we're doing and not like the sort of, there's a sort of whole like startup culture, right? Around like, oh, you raised funding or you did this or whatever. Um, they, nobody cares about that, right? And, and a lot of times, right? Like, oh, I, I work in a startup or, you know, whatever. And it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, and it is, and then the conversation does turn to mangoes, right? Like literally, like, like mangoes are a pretty common topic, right? Um, and that's nice because when I want to think about my work, I think about my work. And when I don't think about my work, I don't want someone talking to me about it. So yeah, like it, you know, there, there's a bit more awareness, but it's so far from the scale of what it is in Silicon Valley. Like once, like an industry begins to affect the social scene it can become really tiresome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can corroborate that about a third of my conversations with Cindy uh, are about mangoes. Yeah, uh, right? <laughs> it's a great place. You care yeah. about fruit. So, you know, one of the, I think like counter examples, right? So you left sort of Bay Area, Silicon Valley tech scene uh, because of what it's become. I think you mentioned that like, you know, there was a special, I guess, weirdness or, or you know, that, that judgmental vibe didn't exist maybe in the post.com uh, Silicon Valley version, but maybe it's there now, you know, but we frequently, or people I think are frequently talking about like Hawaii's economy. Terraformation employs a lot of people in Hawaii. Um, and it's like, is that, I don't know, is that like part of the plan? Is that part of your mission or, you know, and, and like what, to what extent, right? Should Hawaii be more like Miami, right? Like right now you can't be doing crypto without spending some time in Miami. Um, or is it like, no, actually, why you should stay sort of the way it is? Um, you know, where on the spectrum do you think that, that you land? Um, well, I do have something like specific about crypto, which is like Hawaii happens to have like specific state laws to make it unfriendly to crypto, which is not great. Um, though I, I don't really feel like Hawaii should try to be like a center of crypto. Um, it's just like people will hear aren't able to participate as much in crypto because of these like state banking laws. So um, if there's any state legislators listening to this, you should look into that. Um, I think that, like Hawaii has its own path to carve when it comes to whatever it is in tech. Um, my intuition is that it's probably like around sustainability um, because there isn't really like a center for that in the world yet. Um, and when you work on climate, I, I found that like there's a there's sort of climate tech movement right within tech, like people moving into climate specifically, and there's a certain culture there that's like a, a much closer connection to like the earth or the planet or our home. Um, I mean, like if you work in crypto, you don't really think about that, right? And if you work in like SaaS, you don't really think about that, right? But when you work in climate, like you really like are thinking about the planet, and yeah, like people are like different. Um, levels of like sophistication about that. Um, but, but I think like there, there's an alignment here somewhere, right? Um, and I think there's like, it, Hawaii has its own path to whatever its specialty may be. Um, and I don't know what it is, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it feels like in a lot of ways, like bringing more I guess bringing more people or bring more, making it more inclusive, actually, you know, people also bring a lot of bad effects to Hawaii. Um, yeah. So it has to be like this conscious, like, Hawaii is going to do it this way, like, yeah. you know, its own way, right? You can't really, like, there's a lot of places that try to be the next Silicon Valley. And it's like, okay, well, Hawaii's got its own way of doing it and whatever it's going to be. So. And you think it should be climate? It's probably going to be something about sustainability. Hmm. It can lead the world. Remember that England took over the entire world. It was a little island. Hawaii has aloha to offer the world. 
can lead the world from the middle of the Pacific. Yeah, I thought that was one of the really compelling things uh, when I learned about terraformation is Hawaii has so many different biomes represented throughout the islands. Um, you know, like if the the site for Pacific Flight, for instance, is like very desertified, used to be a thriving sandalwood forest, um, and being able to prove out that that we can restore that to what it was, um, like I guess it makes it more possible, more likely that we could do something similar throughout other places in the world. Um, not that it's exactly the same and every biome is like different and all these other challenges, but um, if we can't do that, then that obviously is like right. probably not very promising. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, it at least has a higher starting bar for anywhere anywhere that we could start. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of challenges here that like if you learn to overcome them, they they help you in other places. Mm. Are there similar types of like on that line of sustainability, like types of businesses or uh, companies that you think should be started in Hawaii that maybe aren't at, in the mission of terraformation, but that are maybe adjacent? Like interesting uh, things that you're seeing happening. I think recycling solar and geothermal are like three really um, big ones. Uh, right, like when you're on an island, there's no way there's nowhere you can put your trash like your trash stays with you so like taking recycling to like a very high end like to heights would be something that like would benefit the islands a lot and then the world right because the the globe spaceship earth is an island right our trash isn't going anywhere we can't actually throw it into the sun and in any case if you throw it in the sun these are like half manufactured materials that are actually like kind of valuable so you should be recycling right um, so I think developing recycling technology and industries on the island would be like disproportionately beneficial. Um, solar is another one um, because, right, right, like because we're remote, we have to spend all this fuel like shipping stuff between the islands to the islands, right? And it's like, it's horrible. Like for all of its like leadership and sustainability right now, like Hawaii has the highest emissions per capita of any state in the US. And it is because of like all of the shipping. Um, and so like solar, um, solar driven transport, right? Like hmm. that stuff would be disproportionately beneficial. It would, I also think that like economically speaking, um, Hawaii, both the big island and the smaller islands would benefit, benefit enormously from like uh, low carbon public transit systems because it's small, right? Like, and that would reduce transportation and fuel costs on people and that like, so then it's like cheaper and then everyone has more money to spend, right? Like that would just be like an economic boom. Um, and then, so solar and like, um, yeah, pu public transit. Geothermal is also, I actually found that like you can do geothermal even in places that don't have like volcanoes, right? I, I found that like you can do it in like the Midwest, right? But the, but the Big Island has a unique opportunity with geothermal, but it's like, it's been so, politically connected with colonialism, that it's very difficult. Um, but I, I think it's like something that like, the island has a unique advantage. And mm -hmm. I think the things need to be like developed for the benefit of people here, rather than like investments by foreign outside companies, right? Because then like profits flow out, right? But if you like develop it here, then it lowers costs for everything. Everyone here has more money to spend and you have like economic progress here for the people, right? Mm -hmm. So there, yeah, there's a whole bunch of areas that would like disproportionately just like work well or have like disproportionate benefits for Hawaii. Um, and therefore a lot of extra incentive to like take them to like really, like to take them like really far. Yeah, I, I like that. It sounds like uh, based on Levi's uh, response in the chat here, uh, one really great opportunity is, is the first electric Toyota Tacoma should have a massive impact on emissions here in Hawaii. Um, we're at 10 minutes until the end of the talk. Um, so I'm just gonna start reading out some questions. If anybody else has questions, you can drop them in the chat and then we'll answer them. Um, but we had a couple people submit questions um, as part of their sign up. One that I wanted to start with was um, somebody asked, Roger asked, is Hawaii green enough? Uh, how do we get more trees planted in urban Honolulu? And can we do an adopt a tree program? Uh, Hawaii is not green enough. Um, Hawaii used to be a lot greener. Do you mean like tree-wise greener or like renewables nice? 
type breeder. It's like, well, there were a lot more trees before colonists mm. came, right? And we could have a lot of those back. Um, and then it's also just like in terms of renewables and sustainable energy, it's like nowhere near where it really could be. Um, there's so much sun here. Um, and there's a lot of, I guess, It's not actually like entrenched political, whatever. It's, it's just like political inertia and industry inertia. It's like, I find it's like, it's actually just hard to get people to get off their ass and do something that's like good for them. Um, you know, it's like, how often do you eat vegetables, right? Like, are you going to start your new exercise program? Like, no. Okay, now imagine like bureaucrats have been doing something for like 20 years, right? Like, it's really hard. Um, yeah. Even when you can show them, this is clearly good for you. Within five years, you make all your money back and you have like 20%, right? Like gains on this. Um, and, and so like Hawaii is nowhere near what its potential could be. Like it could be amazing. <laughs> so, like I've actually recently begun commissioning uh, solar punk art. Um, and one of the things that, oh, do I have this here? I can't find it. Oh, wait. So like sort of create an actual vision of what it could look like. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like Hawaii could be like super green and super awesome and like a really great place to live. That's cool. Yeah, I've seen like a, like a studio, a Ghibli inspired or sort of meld with like a cyberpunk sort of vibe, um, which is super cool. Um, Maxwell asks, should an entrepreneur pursue graduate studies or start getting their hands dirty in real world ventures after getting their bachelor's? Oh, um, anyways, here's, by the way, a solar punk future of Big Island um, oh. that I commissioned. If anyone wants that, it is available for free distribution, so let me know. Uh, wait, what was the question? <laughs> Uh, do you recommend entrepreneurs pursue graduate studies or jump straight into uh, real world? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, okay, so you don't have to make that decision as hard and fast as you might think. Um, I know a lot of really good people who started companies when they got their PhD, right? Like Duolingo is started by like a college professor. He happens to be an unusually brilliant college professor, right? But like, there's a lot of PhD people who like take the stuff that they figured out in their PhD and they turn it into a company. There's also people who just like don't go to college um, and then they start their company. Um, there's a time in your life when it's right. Um, and you'll sort of feel that. Um, I started Terraformation, which was the first like real company that I started when it seemed that that was the necessary next step. And you should keep in mind that like, you can go to graduate school um, and drop out, right? <laughs> like, you know, make sure you stay in touch with your friends who are in companies because at some point they may recruit you. And if the opportunity looks right, then you just drop out and you go. Um, and a lot of people in Silicon Valley do that. They're like, in, in fact, like some of the more like preferred candidates for hire are like people who are dropping out of you know, you want like master's programs or PhD dropouts, right? Those are like ideal because they've, they've learned most of the stuff, um, but they didn't like bother to get the degree and you know, get them. So that you don't actually have to make a trade out there. You can just like do graduate studies and then like drop out when the opportunity seems right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully they, they figure it out before getting too far into it and spend a ton of money and then donate. Yeah, they're, they're, right, exactly. <laughs> Um, well, it, it, on the other hand, you can be like, well, I'm going to stop spending money and I'm going to start making money. All right. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> this this uh, talk brought to you by UH Pace. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Ange Angelo's question is uh, cybersecurity and food security are two major issues that face us here in the Pacific. How are you addressing these concerns or are these concerns for your platform? Um, Uh, I don't really know much about cybersecurity, so I'm just going to talk about food security. <laughs> um, 
So the things that we found out economically, economically about solar desalination is that I'm pretty sure that solar desalination can solve an enormous fraction, if not all, of food security problems, especially for islands. Islands, uh, first of all, islands are going to be like disproportionately affected and most earliest by climate change, but also because islands always chronically suffer from a freshwater scarcity problem, um, right? Because like fresh water just comes from like the mountains, right? Like it rains and you collect the mountains or collect the water from the mountains. And if there's enough for your crops, then you've got enough for your crops. Otherwise, you're hoping for shipments from the outside, right? And, and water is a direct limiter to agriculture. Um, however, if you can produce water from the sea and you can use, do it without emissions using solar, then you have an infinite supply of water. Um, and solar also allows you to pump the water inland. I actually believe that this is an enormous game change for all of humanity. And within the next 15 years, like we will change what has been like the ancient tyranny of the water cycle. It's like this like, fancy phrase that I've gotten out for this, right? Which is like, since the dawn of time, fresh water has always been sourced from upstream up in the mountains, right? It's like glacier flow, which is a snow, which is the same thing as like rain in the mountains. And so as a result, there's a limited amount. You have this dynamic where someone who's upstream has control of the water, you know, compared to someone who's downstream. And then you have all of the politics that go around like the water trading and the water rights, um, or you just don't have any politics and the person upstream is just like controls everyone downstream, right? Um, but you can now flip that. You can now make water at the sea. Um, this is true, basically, th this will affect the entire world, right? So it's not just islands. However, islands are most acutely affected by um, water scarcity and therefore food scarcity. And the cost of solar has now dropped to a point where it's, it's still relatively expensive if you're doing it as a private individual, but as a government program and a, like that would be like a percentage of tax like revenue, it's now small enough that it's absolutely the right investment for like basically every municipal government on any island to invest in solar power desalination to just like massively increase the amount of freshwater availability to like both for residents and for agriculture on the island. Um, so, and I think like once the rest of the world really figures this out, it's going to be like a huge change. Like it'll be a really good one because like. I actually think, you know, you talk, you talk about like wealth inequality in the world and there's a lot of reasons for wealth inequality, but one really fundamental one is access to water because you might think it's like it's access to land, but it's actually access to fertile land and land is fertile because of freshwater availability. This has always been the case since like all of human history, but now you can invert that. And it's not that like now you can get water and these people can't get water. It's now everyone has more water, a potentially infinite supply of water um, and like, now that I've studied this, I'm like, wow, water is like way, way more central to like every element of like human civilization ever. And now that we can produce it using low carbon methods from the sea, and by the way, the amount of water that the human race would need to like double or triple its like current intake by using freshwater from sea is only like one billionth of the entire like volume of the ocean. So it's not gonna like, not gonna suck up all the water. In fact, we're never going to suck it up because like it just goes back down into the ocean. <laughs> so um, yes, exactly. And so like Hawaii understands this in a very deep way because like the word for wealth is water, right? And so I think this is going to change the world. I think islands and any, any enlightened government of any island place should get right on this because it will like change the whole economy and the whole society and like everyone will be way better off so yeah so i'm very passionate about the water thing yeah well it's interesting to think about it as um yeah this like very very precious resource that i think everyone takes for granted all the time because it just comes out of our faucet um right but yeah hmm. uh i know we're at time ishan anything like what, do you have any like parting words of wisdom for aspiring entrepreneurs or people, um, you know, possibly trying to, to follow a similar path to you? Um, I guess it's like, don't be afraid of failure. Um, we are often conditioned through our schooling to think of failure as meaning like you didn't get anything out of it, right? Like you take a test and you, 
you know, you study for it and you like get a good grade or you fail it. And if you fail it, it's over. That sucks. That was bad. You lost. In real life, that's not actually how it works. In real life, you will like try things and you might succeed or you might fail. However, usually if you try something very hard in life, like the harder the thing is and the more likely you're to fail it, and the, the more complex it is, the more time and effort and attention you put into trying it, right? So, so I also mean like, don't try in like a trivial way where you like just have to, right? If you try really hard at really hard things and you fail them, you don't actually come away with nothing. You come away with an enormous amount of valuable experience. And you know this if you play video games and probably a lot of you play video games which is in video games generally you don't worry about failing you just go up against like the boss and you fight them and then you fail and you get killed and then like obviously you learn something because the next time you do it you do it a bit better and like on your 10th try you finally do it but it's because you like accumulated learning every time you failed people do not actually apply this to their real lives because they're conditioned to think of failure as like um like you took a test at school and you failed. Now you failed the unit. Okay, on to the next lesson. You failed this unit. Um, now, some schools are getting better at this. Like, well, teachers will say, okay, you can retake the test. You just keep retaking the test until you get it right. Realizing that if you do that, if the student took five times to get the test right, they mastered the material. And that is actually the whole point of the learning, right? So in real life, you can try really, really hard things and even if you don't think your probability of success is like 90 plus percent and you fail, you're gonna learn a lot and you come away with a lot of experience. Um, my uh, career looks like a unbroken string of successes or whatever. It looks like you just, you know, you just like win, but that's not the case. It's more about at bats. Like I have failed in all sorts of like various ways. <laughs> and because like, the, the, my attitude was right like you know try to take the job where you learn the most so like if you're always paying attention and trying to learn from whatever it is you're experiencing or you're doing you will gain a lot from failing at trying to do really really hard things and usually the world doesn't end upon your failure um you get to try again and the next time you do it you're going to be way better at it and you, you will be like whoa i learned like a ton from this right like so i guess that's like one lesson for when you're starting out, don't be afraid of failure, especially when you're young. Yeah, great reminder. Um, okay, we are at time. Thank you so much, Ishan, for taking the time to uh, talk with me today and for sharing your lessons to everybody here. Uh, and thank you for uh, to Addy and Tracy from UH. Um, I'm going to hand it back to uh, Addy to go ahead and close this out. Yes, thank you, Jonathan and Ishan, for participating. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us today on Zoom. The best way to find um, PACE's latest events is to sign up for our newsletter. So you can sign up on our website. And that concludes our program. Um, thank you guys. And make sure you sign up for our newsletter. Bye. Thanks, Eric. Thank you.